You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Julian Warwicker with Weekend and I have two guests with me in the studio for the rest of the programme who will offer their perspectives on the news and talking points of the day. Natasha Call is here, London-based Kashmiri novelist and writer. She teaches politics and international relations at the University of Westminster. Natasha, good morning. Good morning, Julian. And Loretta Napoleoni is here, Italian author, journalist and political analyst. Loretta, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you both here in person. It's not something we've done very much in recent <laughs> times, yeah. for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, Natasha, a word about your your work balance in terms of the difference of the writing, some of it fact, uh, fiction, some of it uh, commentary journalism, the teaching. How do you fit it all together? Oh, very well, I should hope. <laughs> um, I think that it's like speaking different languages. If you speak different languages, then you don't even realize that you're switching from one to the other. So. Uh, writing about, in fact, the same things, uh, there is a certain way in which academic work presents itself and it has to be grounded in rigor. But then there is a very good case for the link between that <clears throat> and what difference it makes in the world and its impact and community. And of course, the thing that really moves people, anyone, is stories. So the narratives are what move us, the ideas are what make things happen. So I believe that that's equally important and uh, you know, if anyone can change the world, as Kennedy, as JFK said, <laughs> and we all must try. Is the fiction, though, to a degree, a, a release from all that rigor that you've just described? Um, I wouldn't say so, because the process of creative work is really hard. Getting a story to resonate with people is really hard. So it, it has its own kind of intensity. But I think that stories do reach people. And my fiction is political fiction. And uh, it's, it's a way of telling the same story, getting people to empathize, uh, to work with affect. And that, I think, is what makes it valuable for me. Uh, Loretta, what does your journalism tend to specialize in? Future Tense, uh, Natasha, was your most recent. I was going to say Future Tense is the title of my latest mm, I novel. Struck by, I was struck by the uh, link. Oh, and, uh, yes, yes, indeed. And I, and I, I completely agree that mm. we feel that we are in a speeded up reality all the time. And perhaps, you know, when the steam engine came around, everyone thought the same. But uh, the important difference, I think, now is that there is an entire realm of experts that are supposed to be beyond the purview of the public. And that to me is dangerous. When that, wi when that gap widens to the extent that people don't feel that they have the requisite knowledge or the skills to be able to and ask the right questions even about where we are headed. And this is something that I struggle a lot in with my work on artificial intelligence and ethics that you know these are these are technologies that are changing the world but how many of how many people do really know what you know what that's going to do in terms of our social relations mm. in terms of our own identities and so on and, and also how many people sitting in in seats like mine know enough to ask the right questions i'm sure as you well do. well that's very kind of you i'm not sure it's true actually but anyway um those are my guests natasha call loretta napoleoni plenty more to come from them in the next uh, couple of hours and we are going to talk about artificial intelligence actually a little bit later on in the program we go to the democratic group and strike a chord absolutely you. i was thinking of that that while these are very complex conflicts uh, and the scale of tragedy is of course almost hard to grasp the the basic matter is that governments must be inclusive and especially where countries are very diverse and the lack of having governments that have representations from different regions that that are not inclusive is what makes people feel unrepresented and then there are of course the competing interpretations um, if you know, if you ask me, I think that the idea of ethnic conflict is all too often used in the context of, especially the African continent, as a go-to uh, thing. Uh, and ethnic ethnic uh, divisions are important, but the economic interests and the other kinds of strategic interests are equally important to uncover. So, for instance, the Rwandan in, uh, economic interests in Eastern DRC. Uh, you know, those sorts of questions are are really vital and. Um, and I think that um, that the way forward, as with this conflict, and of course it looks very pessimistic right now, is diplomacy. And again, regional diplomacy. Kenya has played a role, but like you said, you know, solutions from within. Uh, Loretta, would you would you echo that? Because you take out of it. 
if I may just begin by saying uh, I'm, it's so great that you're doing two stories on, Af uh, you know, on Africa to begin with, because it's really important to challenge Afro pessimism. And we must really know more about what's going on in a continent and in countries that are geographically not very far from us, but empathetically seem to be really far. I think it's both inexcusable and incredible that 95% of all uh, malaria uh, cases and deaths happen in Africa, and we still don't have a solution for it. Uh, during COVID, the lack of vaccines in many African countries became important. So the, the whole point about differential worth of life and our need to focus on saving lives, lives and human potential at a planetary level is really important. And so this is this is a step forward. Uh, it's great that they're doing it. Uh, the Oxford vaccine, which does seem to have a much greater efficacy, and, and she did say that that's going to be rolled out too, uh, hopefully will pave the way for these lives not to be lost. Mm. Uh, it is a, a completely, you, you know, uh, in, in, uh, un unbelievable yeah. that so many young children have to die. Uh, and it's taken so long to even get to this point yes. as well. But I mentioned your writing, and we talked about that a little bit earlier on, but I know you have a connection with Bhutan, Take us to Bhutan, even put it on the map for many of us. Yes. Um, so one of my articles begins with the words, where is Bhutan on the asymmetric, <laughs> uh, you know, asymmetric in betweenness of Bhutan and geopolitics. It's a, you know, traditionally described as a small country in between India and China. And that seems to be the exhaustive way in which it is seen. However, I would like to tell the listeners that it's a country that had a very interesting transition to democracy uh, in tw 2008. Uh, when, uh, uh, which was, you know, top down in the sense that people weren't happy with the move to a democracy and had a referendum been conducted at the time about the desirability of this transition, it would have failed. So it's a country that that's had that. It's also a country that's pioneered the concept of gross national happiness as a, a, a you know, as a challenge to just a purely material focus on well-being. Uh, it is a country that mandates 60% of, uh, of its territory remain under forest cover in perpetuity as per its constitution, uh, which is also a sensible move because it is a high, you know, fragile, high altitude ecosystem mm. and climate change is a big threat for the country. Um, it's it's a if you said take me to Bhutan, so yeah, you're on a Druk airplane. You see the shadow of the plane on the mountains. It's one of the shortest runways anywhere in the world. The airport doesn't look anything like an airport. All architecture is traditional and beautifully carved. There are phalluses painted on um, on houses, which is uh, another thing that people from outside find very interesting because they're a symbol of fertility. It's also a small state. And as uh, you know, from a politics IR perspective, I think we should pay more attention to small states. They're often green, resilient, innovative in their diplomacy. But, but, but are they, is it easier for them to be green and innovative and to, for example, measure happiness because they are small, do you think? Well, they have, they have their fair share of problems on a smaller scale. And one of the big problems is that as a country that is one of, uh, it's it's the only Asian country in the uh, top 20 in the Global Peace Index, but it's also uh, the only, uh, one of the only uh, few uh, carbon negative countries. So that imposes an economic cost and offset against the environment. So it's it, it actually does good for the world without getting much in return. Uh, Loretta has a question, a brief one, if you would. Yeah, so I have a friend who, who went to Bhutan uh, recently, and she said it was really difficult to get in, meaning, you know, you have to book yourself uh, months and months in advance because they don't let people in so easily. It's also extremely expensive, um, which I mean, you and know, it's interesting, yes, you know, happiness, I, uh, not GDP. Which is, which is a conscious policy. So tourism has a low volume, high value tourism. It's a conscious policy. And in order to promote sustainable tourism. And in fact, during COVID, they lost very, uh, you know, there was a very little loss of life, but they completely closed down their borders, as with many small countries with, uh, you know, limited medical infrastructures. But yes. Uh, you mentioned it's border with China, and that's where we're going now, because the World Health Organization has given a positive reaction to the news that China is easing its co- in exile. Uh, Natasha, the Chinese authorities are not renowned for shifting in the face of public opinion, but do you think that's what they've done this time? Uh, I think yes, indeed. And I think that they would, it would be very hard for them not to, given the way in which the global opinion on China has shifted in recent years for very good reasons. Uh, and the demands of the people. I mean, I think that uh, instead of, of uh, continuing to clamp down and have more spectacles that would bring 
uh, more flack upon them. They've just decided to lift some of the restrictions. But again, which areas are they doing this in? Is this just to appease a certain affluent middle class or otherwise comfortable areas? Because what precipitated this immediately was the, I mean, proximate factor was the uh, the fire in, in uh, you know, in, in, in Urumqi, in Xinjiang. And uh, in, in that context, I think globally to us looking on, I, I am, like many others, in absolute awe of these protesters in China. And they should also tell us to challenge the stereotypes that are very common in the West. This idea of Chinese people equals Confucianism equals conformity. These are people, you know, the, the yearning for uh, freedom and rights is universal. And these protests have shown that even the strongest, most authoritarian states have to, uh, at some point, recognize that. Uh, this is not, though, Tiananmen Square, Loretta. Is no, it? no, no, it's not. Uh, um, I think this potentially is much more serious because Tiananmen Square was mostly student. Uh, it was, you know, an elitish. Can I just very quickly say, no, I would want to add that they are also in power because they have the entire authoritarian infrastructure of the state of and repression. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't understand what you mean. With that, 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 the, that, that people's freedoms are curtailed, that there's the terror of the doorbell, there's enforced disappearances, Chinese lawyers who've, go, who've gone missing, people who speak uh, up, the man on the bridge. I mean, the the, yeah, the, the resentment against a regime that represses people's rights. Yeah, but this also happened before 1989. Was, was, yes, was, absolutely. Uh, hmm. So, so it, it isn't you know. a democracy. No, no, no. no, no, no. And, no, no and the party no. is in power no, because it represses. Oh, but she not. wasn't suggesting yeah. that. No, no but I what was, I mean is that it isn't doing a great job. And that's why it's in power. There's yeah. also all the corruption. There's the yeah. land deals. There's the repression in Taiwan. But, and, no, no, uh, yes. Sorry, in, in yeah. Tibet and Xinjiang. Go on, okay, but, point, so, no. but you know, basically the point was a comparison between 1989 yeah. <clears throat> and today. So we were not discussing China. We were making a comparison. In 1989, there was not a middle class in China. It, today, there is a middle class. And that is the key issue. Of sure, they're, they're doing, I think that economically they've, do, they've done way better, but I still think that the repression was there in 1989 and it's there now. Yeah, so I think you're in agreement on that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good. 23 <laughs> minutes past the hour. Um, so I'll come to you in a moment. Um, Loretta, there's a bigger picture. Natasha, you're nodding at that last observation. Thank you. Yes, I completely agree that as, uh, you know, as fiction writers and filmmakers and creative artists have the ability and should have the rights and the ability to make films and, and write about all sorts of things. However, the issue in the present context is that this film is part of an ideological mm. investment yeah. in, in the the divided in the divided state of Kashmiris, divided along religious lines, that in fact also fuels and perpetuates the conflict. So the entire point of the film is to undermine that solidarity. And because it's this simplistic Islamophobic uh, morality tale, it presents all Kashmiri Muslims as vile, lecherous, etc., and problematic, and Hindus as the the righteous victims. Now, this in itself would also not be a problem because filmmakers will mm. make films. Can I just but, pick you up on one point? Yes. Does it necessarily perpetuate the conflict or does it purely mirror what is sadly already going on? Right. Well, I think it does also perpetuate because it's happening against the backdrop of uh, a transformation in Indian politics where what about Kashmiri pundits is the refrain to any kind of violence against Muslims, that it's justified by recourse to this. And therefore, <coughs> it, it has a clearly divisive message. And the fact that it's it has been endorsed by figures in government a government that actually, uh, surprisingly, does not even have a single Muslim member of parliament. So this government, which has overseen through its two tenures, you know, a rise in violence against minorities, against that backdrop, a film like this that gets, this, uh, you know, the endorsement of the state undermines solidarity and has that divide and selectively tells a story is problematic. Now that the jury had, you know, for pointing this out, He's he's again also in his rights as a creative oh, artist to oh. to condemn the film to say that it's problematic, and likewise for you know diplomats will do what diplomats do. But to compare the Kashmiri Pandit exodus to the Holocaust to the tragedy of the Holocaust is 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 just not correct. Mm -hmm. And your your guest said you know it's a democracy. Yes, but according to Freedom House, India is now a partly free democracy. In which case, how do you get? around this because as you as you pointed out very clearly you know he's he has the right to make a film yes. like this of course and you're, you're not about to say you can't do that any longer mm -hmm. um how do you then 
label it? How do you frame it? How do you explain to the wider public where this is coming from, which is where Loretta and I were a moment ago? I think the answer is really simple, that you just allow all kinds of cultural productions, that you allow this story to be told, and then you also allow films to be told films to be screened that tell other stories. But in fact, that's not the case. People, vigilantes would go and force cinemas to show this film and stone and attack films that are telling a different story. So it's against the backdrop of a very state-centric uh, media. Uh, audiences in India do hear about Kashmir, but that's a particular perspective. The problem is not that there are different views. The problem is that those different views, within reason, should all be available in the public sphere. And that, that's the point. Yeah. isn't it? And you wouldn't argue with that at all? No, I wouldn't argue with that at all. Um, I also would add that perhaps, you know, it needs to, to be specified that if it's a work uh, of fiction, uh, then it's not a documentary in order to prevent people from, I mean, this ambiguity. I'm mean, interested because, I mean, you write fiction, no. but you um, also do rigorous yeah. journalism. So, yeah. so this and, balance is And academic one, work. Yeah, and absolutely. and I think it's the, the idea is, is to is to actually have that up front. Yeah. Not saying anything and claiming one's position is objective in a certain context is also a kind of endorsement. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, you could say it's not based it, on real yeah. facts. It, it, <laughs> see, if, if that had happened, then I doubt that the film would have had yes. the kind of reach that it does. So that's what I exactly. meant about the fact that there is a very fertile discourse of competing victimhoods. You know, Kashmiri Muslim suffering and Kashmiri Pandit suffering. And these are seen as if these people are not Kashmiris. Yeah. Uh, people who care about justice of what happened to Kashmiri Pandits. By the way, I should add, I'm not just a Kashmiri, but also a Kashmiri Pandit. So, you know, but I am not the ideal subject of Hindutva, although if you go by, you know, what I'm supposed to be, I would be. The, the point here is that those, those, all of those tragedies are part of of a, a, an, an overall tragedy that needs investigation. Why not investigate the massacres Why of all kinds of people, of all uh, religions? Why not declassify the files relating to the exodus so we know what happened? In the absence of fact, what what gets uh, you know continuously churned out is ideology passing as fact. And that's, that's truly problematic here. I'm glad we allowed plenty of time to discuss mm -hmm. that. Um, you're listening to Weekend. <laughs> I thought that was so exciting. I mean, our our younger <laughs> selves are often idealists, not just for ourselves, as all adults actually are, but also for others. And I think it wouldn't do harm for more of us to delve into our younger selves, assuming, of course, that we kept the journals. And I was just thinking I've maintained a, a dream journal since 2005. So if I can have ever get those dozens of diaries typed up, I would love to do this and to see what you know, what my inner self or psychic self um, thinks. But on, on a more general note, I think it's it's uh, it's great. It's mm. part of the playful ludic appeal of AI that we can now just feed it text and it'll give us uh, uh, paintings. We uh, can just feed it literally anything and it'll, it'll give us art. Uh, Michelle, did you get any surprising answers from your younger self? Hmm, I think the most surprising answer I got was actually when I asked my younger self what she thought was the greatest systemic issue in the world. Um, you know, it's at the moment is quite extraordinary in the face of winter and what that might bring. Absolutely. I mean, the tragedy of this conflict and the fact that we still have this kind of territorial conflict in the 21st century and that drags on for as long. Um, the the I, I quite liked the description of those places of refuge as points of invincibility. I thought that was very striking and uh, and and hopeful. Uh, I do hope, though, that uh, that uh, sooner rather than later, that there is a conclusion to the hostilities because the Ukrainians deserve better. The Ukrainians. Um, uh, must be supported as they have been. And I truly hope that the winter does not bring the kinds of attacks that were being hinted at because uh, uh, people are have already been struggling for so long and then uh, the, the winter already is very harsh. Uh, Loretta, you must fear for the winter here. You're talking about a conclusion. Uh, yes, and uh, and I think that uh, the the fact that the NATO allies have have steadfastly been in support and that the the new uh, oil price cap is is in effect, mm -hmm. I think all of these plus the the making it difficult for oil tankers, Russian oil tankers, to get insurance, uh, all of those those things hopefully will contribute also to realization within Russia that uh, this isn't uh, well, this isn't right, and it mustn't go on. 
Well, I mean, the narratives in this war are equally important because the places where there isn't a strong enough feeling against Russian aggression are also the places where a certain weaponization of history, irredentism, etc. has played well. And that, uh, you know, that anti-Western sentiment, I think, will become even more important in international politics. And we must find all sorts of ways to address that at, at that level as well. It's uh, 21 minutes, I um, clearly will not. Uh, we've not got a great deal of time, so I just want to bring my guest in for a brief observation and then I'll come back to you for a final word. Natasha, what do you take out of this? Well, I think that I entirely agree that it can be clumsy curiosity, uh, but to then insist and uh, where a person really is from and to want to know if that is specifically Africa is problematic. I think racism has no place in any society and age and uh, status is not an excuse. I was very heartened by the palace response. I do think that this is also about a recitation of power hierarchies it's you know as as uh, uh, as your uh, you know as the person who faced it said uh, it is also a kind of epistemic violence if you ask somebody where they're from and if i say bloomsbury and they'd be like no but really where are you from and i'd say kashmir and then they'd be like which side of kashmir it is i mean one must also interrogate the desire to deny somebody the right to uh, have an affinity and a belonging for wherever they want to. And I think that this this also often indicates a very problematic understanding about the past, that certain people cannot, even in a civic nationalist as opposed to an ethnic nationalist country, be allowed to belong. Um, brief thought, Loretta, the palace has been pretty strong. And were you encouraged by the palace reaction? Um, and Natasha, you were saying the same thing. Uh, Yes, I think this this kind of uh, thing must be called out and there must be no excuses made for it because uh, what a person, you know, I, I go to this in terms of the eye and the eye, what your eye sees me as being and what my eye, the capital I, sees myself as being need not be the same. But you have to trust me if I want to define myself a certain way and that goes for for everyone. Why should that be narrower for certain kinds of identities than, than others? And... Uh, uh, you know, I, I would hope that our Prime Minister never gets asked that question. I think people <laughs> often insist on asking that question so they can relay a story about the wonderful time they had in India once upon a time. <laughs> Absolutely. I actually had somebody say, you know, yes. we ruled you yes. once. Yes. As if I was there. Well, I was, I'm, I'm Italian, frankly, you know, and I've been asked that question all over the world and the comments was always about the food. So here we are. Again, another stereotype. Exactly. <laughs> that. Uh, on that note of stereotypes, reasonably harmonious ones, um, we're bringing the conversation to a close. Thank you both very much. Lorette, Thank you very uh, much, Natasha. Julian. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh,